Right. Sorry for a slight delay in starting, but good evening and welcome to this, which is the second uh, in a series of seminars that we're hosting in Chambers. And the topic tonight is uh, employment status. And although I'm confident that there's a well-informed and knowledgeable audience, you're all familiar with the basics of employment status, the reason we chose it as a topic is because... Um, Without thinking very hard, I can think of five cases in the last three years that have gone to the Supreme Court on this topic. We've got Auto Cleanse and Belcher, Preston, uh, X and Mid Sussex, CAB, Jivraj and Ashwani, and um, last month, Bates, Van Winkelhoff and Clyde and Co. So it struck me that perhaps it isn't quite as straightforward as we all think it is because it's managed to make five trips to the Supreme Court in three years. And that's probably more than any other topic um, that I can think of in employment law. And the second reason we chose it is I remember a quote um, from Lord Justice Mummery in the case of Dakas, which you'll remember from about seven or eight years ago, where he said that the question of employment status is now the most intractable as well as the most basic in the whole of employment law. So that seemed another good reason to look at this topic um, afresh. So we're going to um, split it into three. We're all each going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I'm going to kick off and talk a bit about employment status under the Employment Rights Act, looking at mutuality of obligation, control, and if time permits, uh, tripartite arrangements. Claire is then going to speak, and she's going to deal with the position under the Equality Act which is obviously different and more akin to worker status under the Employment Rights Act. And then Rebecca is going to uh, finish with um, considering uh, the position of partners and that uh, difficult topic, um, zero-hour contracts. So that hopefully will take us through to about 10 to 7, at which stage... Um, it says Q&A, but that's not really what it is. It's a chance for anybody to share a view they may have, either on what's been said or not been said, or if you've got a question, to raise it. Um, so that's where we're going to go. Uh, because I'm obviously regarded as someone with a poor memory, I've been given a checklist of four things to tell you. Each has an asterisk next to it. The first is there are no fire drills today, so if the fire alarm goes off, you, you have to run for it that way. Uh, secondly, you're asked to fill in um, a feedback form and um, as some sort of incentive to do so, apparently there's a prize draw for a bottle of champagne. So if you do fill it in, you might be a lucky winner. And then thirdly, I'm told that there are drinks, which I've already said. And the fourth thing it says is thank you. Now, I don't know whether that's the person who wrote it saying thank you to me <laughs> or whether I'm supposed to say thank you to you, but I'll err on the side of caution and say thank you to you just in case. So I, I'm going to kick off um, with the topic uh, that I identified. And I, I should say it with some diffidence that, that, that I, I speak to you, as I say, you're a, you're a well-informed, you're a a knowledgeable audience. And when I read um, the blurb that someone's very kindly written about me, uh, I hardly recognize myself. But there is one part of it that is true. And that is, it says that Mr. Rose um, has been involved of two of the most recent lead cases on the issue of status as a worker um, and an employee. What it doesn't say is I lost them both. So with that health warning in place and that exemption in place, uh, I'll kick off. And you should have a paper in front of you. I'm afraid I haven't done a PowerPoint because talking and moving my left hand at the same time is, is, is beyond me. But you will see that the first topic is mutuality of obligation. And I have set out the very well-known quote from Mr. Justice McKenna, in ready mixed concrete. And I don't set that out because I think you've never heard of it. I set it out because it was endorsed as recently as um, Auto Cleanse and Belcher as being the starting point. And I think it's a good starting point because when you're looking at these issues, whether you're advising clients or if you're sitting as an employment judge dealing with a case, what you often need is a structure. 
because in these cases you have a mound of facts. Um, it's often very difficult to have a strategy for breaking them down into what's relevant and what's not relevant. And I think that the three uh, questions that are addressed in uh, Ready Mix Concrete are, are a very good framework to start with. And the first limb uh, is in respect of um, he agrees expressly or impliedly that in performance of that service, sorry, the first limb is the servant agrees in consideration of a wage or other remuneration, he will provide his own work and skill in the performance of some service for his master. So it doesn't actually use the word mutual obligation. But I think it's imported uh, by reference to the fact that it's talking about an agreement. Um, the reason I want to say a little bit about mutuality of obligation is that it's a term of art that we all bandy about. But what I want to try and um, perhaps demonstrate uh, briefly this evening is it isn't always used in the same way by different judges in different cases. Sometimes it has one meaning, which I'll take you to, and other times it has another. And this just isn't just a semantic difference. It's actually a difference with some significance. And the case which tells us, um, I think, most clearly uh, about the two different meanings, I've referred to uh, at the top of page three of the uh, paper, and it's a decision of the EAT called uh, C.N. Drake and Ipos Mori, and it's a decision of His Honour Judge Richardson. And he said this, he said, um, mutuality is used in two distinct separate meanings, one to define whether there is a contract at all, and second to define the nature of the bargain. And in the quote that um, I've set out there at paragraph 29, he says, firstly, and to my mind, most importantly, it is used with reference to the question whether there was a contract between the parties at all. So an employment contract is like any other contract. There has to be an exchange of promises uh, for it to come into existence. And he sets out a well-known passage there from the case of Stevenson and Delphi Diesel Systems Limited, which... Uh, at your leisure, you can read. Um, and then he goes on to give the second um, meaning in which some of the cases uh, use this term, and that's on page four, about three quarters of the way down the page, uh, where he quotes from uh, Mr. Justice Langstaff in Cotswold Development Construction Limited and Williams. And Mr. Justice Langstaff said, it cannot simply be control that determines whether a contract is a contract of employment or not. The contract must necessarily relate to the mutual obligations to work and to pay for or provide it to what is known in the labour economics as the wage uh, work bargain. And then this is going back to his honour Judge Richardson's judgment. He says, in this secondary sense, the concept of mutuality is used with reference to the nature of the contract, particularly, it seems to me, with reference to the first test in ready mix concrete. The emphasis is not really on mutuality as such, but on the nature of the bargain between the parties. Speaking for myself, I would prefer to use the concept of mutuality only in relation to the question of whether a contract existed between the parties but it is inescapable that the concept of mutuality sometimes creeps into the question whether the contract is a contract of employment at all. And I agree with what he says. Strictly speaking, the term mutuality of obligation should be confined to determining whether there is a contract at all and not into determining the nature of the contract. And I said a moment ago that this isn't a sort of semantic, uh, pedantic uh, distinction that's been drawn because the uh, most recent Court of Appeal case that touches on mutuality of obligation is the uh, well-known case of Quashi and Stringfellows Limited, which uh, you will all have encountered. And in that case, the claimant um, was arguing that she had employment status both when she worked and when she didn't work. She argued there was an overarching um, umbrella contract. 
and the Employment Tribunal found against her. And they found that when she was uh, actually working, that there was no contract of employment. And as you remember, that case went to the EAT. And the EAT said the tribunal had got it wrong because they read the tribunal decision in respect of mutuality of obligation. They read the tribunal decision as holding that there was no mutuality of obligation at all when the claimant was actually working, which sounds counterintuitive because there must have been some reason uh, to determine why she was actually there. So when you go to the Court of Appeal, they in fact reinstate the tribunal judgment. And the point I'm making about the confusion about the use of the term mutuality of obligation in the employment tribunal is borne out by what Mr. Justice Elias said um, at paragraph 42. So if you turn to paragraph 10 of the paper, He says this, I accept that the decision of the employment tribunal does somewhat confusingly use the concept of mutual obligation in two rather distinct senses. As Mr. Linden suggested, sometimes it means there are no obligations of any kind, and sometimes it means there were no obligations of the kind necessary to establish a contract of employment. However, I am satisfied that on a fair reading of its decision as a whole, it was not saying there was never any contract in place at all. So that captures really quite nicely and succinctly the point I'm trying to make and why in that case, the conflating of the two led to the confusion that led to what ought to have been quite a straightforward point, ultimately going to the Court of Appeal. I can't leave uh, Kwashi without making another very, I suppose, slightly trite and irrelevant observation, but when I read that case, I was rather struck by Mr. Justice Elias relying upon uh, an apparent comparison, an analogy between the position of golf caddies um, and lap dancers. And I have to say, only an employment lawyer, I think, could find similarities in the activities of the two, or else there are things going on at his golf club that I, I, we ought not to speculate about. So I want to move then from um, mutuality of obligation to a slightly linked point, and that is um, the topic of substitution clauses. So you will um, recollect from the first strand of um, Mr. Justice McKenna's uh, three-limb test in Ready Mix Concrete, the exchange of promises has to be for the employee to provide services personally. And one of the ways people over the years have sought to avoid employment status is to insert substitution clauses. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the two leading cases on it and the distinction which we've historically drawn between clauses which allow an employee to provide a substitute when he or she is unwilling uh, to work and the cases that refer to clauses where you can provide a substitute when you are unable to work. And the two leading cases on that distinction are um, Express and Echo Publications and Tanton, and McFarlane and Glasgow City Council, which I've set out at paragraph 12 of the paper. What I want to do is to draw your attention to uh, what I think is quite an interesting case that isn't from the employment field, but it's from the revenue field. And it's the case of Weight Watchers UK Limited and the, and the uh, revenue. I, I haven't put the um, reference down, but if you want it, it's 2011 UK UT 433. That is the um, upper tribunal of the tax and chancery chamber. Not somewhere, I have to say, I've ever been. But in that decision, Mr. Justice Briggs looks at this um, apparent distinction between uh, being unable, the right to provide a substitute when you are unable to work, and the right to provide a substitute when you are unwilling to work. And historically, we've always taken the view that if you can provide a substitute simply because you're unwilling to work, 
and there's no obligation to provide personal service and therefore no contract of employment. Whereas if you're merely unable, then there's an obligation to provide some service. He doesn't go along with that. He thinks that is something of an oversimplification. So at the bottom of page seven of the paper, he says this, the true distinction between the two types of case is that in the former, so that's the Tanton unwilling case, uh, the contracting party is performing his obligation by providing another person to do the work. Whereas in the latter, so that's the McFarlane type case, the unable case, the contracting party is relying upon a qualified right not to do or provide the work in stated circumstances. One of the qualifications being that he finds a substitute to contract directly with the employer to do the work. He then goes on and refers to counsel for the employee's submission. So you've got to remember in this context, the workers, I'll call them neutrally, don't want to be employees because if they're employees, they're in a less favorable tax regime. So you have the slightly counterintuitive position of the workers arguing against employment status in the revenue cases obviously the employment cases arguing for it. So Mr. Peacock, who appeared for the uh, workers, uh, submitted that the relevant distinction was between clauses providing for substitution where the contractor was unable to work and clauses permitting substitution where the contractor was unwilling to work, relying upon Tanton and McFarlane as illustrative of that distinction. And then the judge says, I'm not persuaded that is the relevant distinction. It is, in the real world, uh, unrealistically um, rigid. And then he gives an example. Take the example of a teacher who is otherwise obviously an employee, but whose contract permits her to absent herself and find a replacement to be engaged for that purpose by her school, where although able to work, she would, for understandable reasons, uh, rather attend a wedding or funeral of a close relative. It would be absurd to treat that sensible provision as incompatible with a contract of employment. And then he sets out what he thinks is the real question. In such cases, the real question is, in my judgment, whether the ambit of the substitution clause, purposefully construed in the context of the contract as a whole, is so wide as to permit, without breach of contract, the contractor to decide never personally to turn up for work at all. That was indeed held to be the true construction of the relevant clause in Tanton. I think that's a really useful case on the question of substitution because as employment lawyers, I think we've become rather straitjacketed. Uh, we think either it's a Tanton case or we think it's a McFarlane case. And I think this is a more original way of looking at it. I think it's a very useful case for a number of other reasons. There's some very useful passages in it on the issue of control and also on mutuality of obligation. Before I leave um, substitution clauses, I just wanted to add this about them. There was a time when lots of people who drafted contracts put them in because they thought it enabled them to avoid employment status for the other party to the contract. My view about it really has always been this, that if you have a substitution clause, there ought to be some economic or business reason for it, rather than simply having it in there. So for example, if you have um, contracts that involve bank work, a bank of nurses, for example, it makes sense to have a substitution clause because you know that there are a pool or a resource, or a pool of people who you know are suitably qualified and you don't really mind who turns up on a particular night, so long as a particular shift is covered. Therefore, having um, a substitution clause makes sense. You don't need to tie a particular individual in to provide a particular service. If you have um, a long-term arrangement where somebody is recruited to work for you because of a particular skill, it makes no sense at all to have a substitution clause because why would you want to have somebody else come along? 
if you have a long-term arrangement and you have a substitution clause, I think if it's to have any hope at all of being held to be anything other than a sham in the autoclens sense, then there perhaps ought to be something in the contract that explains why you've got it there. What is the commercial reason for having it there in order that it makes some commercial sense? So that's enough about um, substitution clauses. I'm now going to just touch uh, briefly um, on the um, topic of control, because there's been another useful uh, EAT case, which I'm sure you've come across on that issue as well. It's one of those issues where different um, constitutions of the EAT and different constitutions of the Court of Appeal lay different degrees of weight on the extent to which there needs to actually be day-to-day -day control. And I accept, of course, that it will vary from uh, occupation to occupation. But if you take the case of Bunce, um, which I've referred to in paragraph 15 uh, of the paper, that was a Court of Appeal case from 2005, and it was uh, one of these tripartite arrangement cases. And Lord Justice Keane, and I've set it out in the first sentence of the quotation, says this, and I've underlined what I think is the um, important point. He said, the importance of control as a feature of contracts of service, and in particular, control not only over what the worker does, but how he does it, is long established. And so some people just focus on those words and say, well, unless you can demonstrate that there's an element of control in respect of how the work is actually done, there's insufficient control, and therefore the second limb of um, Mr. Justice McKenna's statement in Reading Mixed Concrete can't be fulfilled. There's an interesting analysis of control in the case of consistent group and Cowlack. Now, you will all be familiar with that case from the Court of Appeal when it was all about sham contracts, and it was one of those cases um, that went the other way uh, and was overruled effectively by the Supreme Court in autoclens. But in the EAT, the issue wasn't really about sham contracts at all. It was all about control. And there's a very interesting um, passage in it by Mr. Justice Elias, where he analyzes what he thinks is necessary uh, to establish the requisite degree of control. And I've set that passage out, and I won't um, refer to it any further this evening, you can read it if you want to. But the more, rec more recent case is the case of White um, and Troutbeck S.A. Now that case went to the Court of Appeal at the end of last year, and the Court of Appeal, in really quite short judgments, upheld the EAT. What happened in that case is the Employment Tribunal found there was no contract of employment uh, because there was insufficient control. And the EAT overturned that, and then the employers appealed to the Court of Appeal. The judgment that I would invite you to look at is not the Court of Appeal judgments, because in essence, what they say is, we agree with the EAT. But what I would like you and suggest you did look at, if you were looking at this topic, is the judgment of His Honour Judge Richardson again um, in the EAT. The facts of that case were... were very briefly as follows. The, um, it concerned a farm uh, somewhere in Surrey. It was owned by this company, Troutbeck, and a Panamanian company, and they in turn were controlled by a family from Nigeria, so a slightly unusual uh, relationship. And the two claimants were effectively the caretaker and manager of the farm. And what was argued in the employment tribunal is because the family in Nigeria had very little to do with what they actually did, the two claimants on the farm in terms of managing it, that there was insufficient control. And the point that His Honour Judge Richardson makes is this. He goes back to Ready Mix Concrete, and at paragraph 20, I have set out the passage that he relied upon, and it's as follows. Control includes the power of deciding the things to be done, the way in which it should be done, the means to be employed in doing it, the time when, the place where it shall be done. All these aspects of control 
must be considered. Although they don't all have to be present, but they need to be considered in deciding whether the right exists in a significant degree to make one party the master and the other his servant. He then goes on, what matters is lawful authority to command so far as there is scope, and then refers to an earlier decision. And this is the important point, which ultimately is relied upon by the judge to conclude that there was sufficient control in the case. To find where the right resides, one must look first to the express terms of the contract. And if they deal fully with the matter, one may look no further. If the contract does not expressly, expressly provide which party shall have the right, the question must be answered in the ordinary way by implication. The question therefore is not what is actually happening in practice. The question is, what does the contract say about who has the power to determine uh, how things uh, may or may not be done? And we can see that was the analysis adopted by his honour judge Richardson at the top of page 13 uh, of the paper, where he says, in my judgment, what was required was to analyse the terms of the agreement between the parties to see whether expressly or by implication, Troutbeck, in practice Miss Ibru, retained a right of control to a sufficient degree. I do not think this process is really to be found in the ET reasons. And then he concludes, the question is not by whom data to gay control was exercised, but with whom and to what extent the ultimate right of control resided. They will conclude the ET's approach was wrong. So the fact that an employer may not, a putative employer may not in fact be exercising much by way of control is neither really here nor there. The question is, if the contract is to be treated at face value, is what does the contract say about who has the power to exercise uh, the control? The final part of the paper deals with tripartite agreements. And I know you're obviously desperate to hear about all of that. But in fact, I think I've had my allotted time. So if you want to know more about tripartite agreements, you can read it yourself. But I'm now going to hand over to Claire, who is going to speak um, about issues under uh, the Equality Act.